Hallelujah. I'm not going to preach to you today. I'm just going to give you my outline that the Holy Ghost gave to me to give to the church. Because the devil is exerting pressure from all sides. How many of you can say amen to that? The devil's working not just on one side, but all sides. And the way the Lord gave it to me was, it's the push and pull of Satan. The push and pull. You know, when you got a car that's stuck, you don't just push it one way. Sometimes you rock it back and forth and you get it out. And the devil is the same way. If he can't get you from one side, he'll get you from the other side. The Bible says that we are rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus, but the devil's idea is to get you off the rock of Christ, to get you uprooted and away from your faith. Satan's hoping through the push and pull to dislodge your faith. What is the push and the pull of Satan? Well, Daniel 3 tells the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it was the push of the devil. What is the push of the devil? It's the spirit of intimidation. The spirit of intimidation. The devil is out to intimidate God's people. And we're seeing that nationally. We're seeing that in many areas that are very visible today. That there's a push of intimidation. And that, you know, if you're a Christian and you stand for the Lord, that you're got all these ugly labels put to you because the devil is trying to intimidate. It's interesting to me that in Daniel chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he didn't know what the dream was. He told these men, tell me what the dream was. And they said, nobody can do this, but God gave Daniel the dream. And the dream was a big golden image. And he told about the power and the authority of that image. And he said, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Well, that kind of went to Nebuchadnezzar's head. And he decided that since he was the head of gold and there was this beautiful image, that he would make himself a 96-foot tall statue that was nine feet wide and set it in the plain outside of the capital of Babylon. And everybody was to bow before it. Where did Nebuchadnezzar get the idea for that? He got it from God's interpretation of the dream that Daniel gave. And so he misinterpreted it to think he was God. And so we know the story of the Hebrew boys who refused to be intimidated by a 90-foot tall statue and would not worship the image. You know, I think about this, and I think about what would happen today if they were to intimidate us with the same thing. There are eight different things that these boys could have come up with to disobey God. But you know, when you stand, there's no alternative. Either you stand or you fail. You stand or you fall. You bow down or you don't. It's one or the other. And they, they, some of the arguments, they, they could have said, we'll fall down, but not actually worship the image. Let's do that. Number two, they could have said, we will worship it one time and then ask forgiveness. Number three, they could have said, King Nebuchadnezzar has power. We must obey. God will understand. Number four, they could have said, the king appointed us. We owe this to him. Number five, they could have said, this is a foreign land. God will excuse us for following these heathen customs. Anyway, they don't know the difference. Number six, they could have said, our own people set up idols in the temple in Jerusalem. This is not half as bad as that. They could have said, number seven, we're not hurting anybody by bowing down. Number eight, they could have said, if we get killed, how can we help our own people who are in exile? All of these reasons would have been logical and plausible and rational and reasonable, but they would have been disobedience. If the Hebrew boys would have bowed before the shrine of Nebuchadnezzar, they would have forever erased their testimony for God. Daniel's second and third chapter would have been rewritten because these men would have written themselves out of the destiny God set up for them. Folks, let me tell you that Compromise on any level is defeat for God's people. 
stand true to God. Stay in your convictions. Don't let the enemy talk you out of what God has already put in your life. Amen. Because all the devil can do is stand outside and talk and harass you. And he wants you to listen to him. He wants your feet to move so he can call you into compromise. These boys would have never been able again one time in their life could they talk about the power of their God above the other gods because they gave in to the other gods. Hell is populated with people that compromised, forced a little bit, only to get a chance to do what's right. They never got around to it. So don't be a compromiser. Don't let the devil intimidate you into being something that God said no to. If this book says no to it, I don't care who else says yes, it's still no. If God said yes, then it's yes, no matter who else says it's okay. Whatever God speaks in his word, it will stand the test of time. And all these naysayers and all these people that are coming against it, they might as well be butting their head against a cement wall. They will not remove the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Somebody say amen. amen. The devil can't get you through intimidation. The, the, the push, then he gets you through the pull. What's the pull? The pull is seduction. The push is intimidation. The pull is seduction. He'll seduce you. Numbers chapter 23 through 31 is an interesting study. It tells about a king who was afraid of the conquests of Israel. And so he hires a backslidden prophet. Balak does. Hires a backslidden prophet by the name of Balaam. And he says, I'll give you gold. I'll give you treasure. If you will just come up here on this ridge and look down and see Israel's camp. And if you'll curse them. He says, I don't know if I can do that or not. But he made a sacrifice. And Balaam opens his mouth and he pronounces a, a, a two-chapter blessing over Israel. He says, Israel lies in their tents and their God is over them. Israel lies like a lion. And when she rises up and roars, who can stop her? Oh, the presence and the glory of God is on her. And he said, hey, I told you to curse them and you blessed them. And he said, I told you I can't do anything against God. So he took him to another mountain, made another sacrifice, and said, now curse him. And, the, and he makes another prophecy. And this time, he does even more. Blessing Israel. Balak gets so mad, he says, we're going to try it a third time. Three times, these dumb heads. <laughs> tried to outdo God. Tried to curse what God is blessing. Do you understand if you're living for God, you're under the blessing of God. Do you understand that your house is blessed? Your plumbing is blessed. The gas in your car is blessed. Your food that you eat is blessed. You're blessed when you go in and blessed when you go out. You're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. When you walk in, you're blessed. Your house is blessed. Somebody say amen. When you walk out, you're blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you are blessed because God's blessing rests upon your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. Glory. I remember the first year we came here as pastors, there was a man that we rented his house over in Long Beach. And we lived there for a year because I didn't know if, you know, it was kind of a trial thing. I didn't know if I was really called to pastor this church or not. And so 35 years later, I decided I am called. <laughs> But for the first year, I didn't know if I was really called a pastor or not. So I said, well, we'll rent a house and we'll see how it goes. And so we rented this house and this man that owned a photography business over in Long Beach, he, he would come over and make frequent stops, just check on his property and he'd walk in. And he would sit down and look around and he'd say, you know, I just, I just, I just love to come over here and visit with you all. I said, well, that's good. Let's get you a soda and a coffee. <laughs> And then he'd show up again, and I'd say, well, is anything wrong? No, I just, I just enjoy coming over and visiting you all. And he'd sit and look around, and 
And like the third time he came over, he said, you know, there, there's such a peace in this house. I forgot how, how great this house feels. I thought, hey, it's not the house, it's what's in the house. It's the presence of God and the peace of God. And he was feeling that and pulling vibes off of that. And he was thinking it was his architecture, it was his house. And the fourth time he came over, he said, hey, I decided that I like my house so much, I'm moving back into it. Y'all are going to have to leave. I said, really? He said, yeah, you got a month. Find you a place, and you're going to have to leave. I'm taking my house back. I enjoy this house. I forgot how much I like this house. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. When I walked out and Brenda walked out, the blessing of God and the peace of God walked out, and he walked in there. He said, oh, this doesn't feel the same. Of course it doesn't, because the blessing of God is upon the people. Somebody say amen. But it was a blessing. It was the Lord because then we figured out after a year they were going to let us stay and that we were going to, uh, we were called to be here. So we bought a home that we still live in. And uh, it's amazing what people can feel because the presence of God makes the difference. Can I hear an amen? amen. And that is if you stay out of compromise. The blessing of the Lord stays upon your life. And everything that you touch and everything that you do and everything that you have is blessed. Somebody say amen. amen. I told you about last year how the Lord put $2,000 in my checking account. Amen. So I just can't believe that. Well, don't believe it then. But I spent it. I went in there with the, I know the head of the bank, and I went in there with him, and I said, hey, you made a big mistake. Uh, there's 2,000 too much in here. And he said, well, let's look, and started looking. And he said, no, no, no. I said, yes, yes, you made a mistake. You're wrong. No, we're not. I said, where did this 2,000 come from? He said, I don't know. Somebody put it in your account. Thank the Lord. Say, man, I wish God would do that for me. <laughs> I don't know. It's just the blessings of God. They are rich and add no sorrow. Yes, Somebody amen. say amen. 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 So they couldn't curse Israel. There was no cursing. He tried three times. But Numbers 31, chapter 31 and verse 16 and 17 tell what happened. Numbers 23 and the dialogue talking about it doesn't tell you, but you skip over to 3116 and you see what happened. It says that Balaam said to Balak, if you want to get them, we can't curse what God has blessed. There's no way. The angels of God, the power of God, the glory of God's on those people. But if you can't get them that way, you can seduce them. Get the Moabite women and the Midianite women and bring them out because part of their religion, a part of their worship of Baal was cult prostitution. And get the girls to come out and begin to sashay around and present themselves. And it's interesting in the Hebrew, part of the meaning of their name is we are open to you. So these girls came to these Israeli men and said, we are open to you. We will open our arms and our lives to you. And you can have sex with us. The only thing is you must come to our town and worship our God. And before long, they were doing the very thing that the devil laid the trap for. And if the devil can't get you by intimidating you and harassing you, he'll get you through seducing and I want to tell you that most commentators say that there was a bigger problem with the seduction of Baal worship for Israel than the walls of Jericho, than the armies that they stood against, the, the, the powers of mighty armies and chariots could not match the power of the seducing spirit of the world. And folks, we've got to make sure that we are mathematically true to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we do not fall for the seduction of the world. Can I hear an amen? amen. Today, people carry the name, but not the nature of Christ. They call themselves Christians, but they're not in touch with God. They live only by just how they feel, not by their faith. God, help us today to be people that are not seduced into disobedience. Seduced. Seduced. Why do you think Vegas looks like it does at night? It's all about seduction. Bright lights. Why do you think the devil paints up and makes it look good and has to do it in the dark because he's so ugly that if you got a good look at him, you'd run the other way. But it gets so dark. Somebody say amen. amen. I remember a man that got saved in our church years ago said that one night him and his friend were in a bar and he said this barmaid was hitting on my friend and my friend said I'm going to take her home. And he said the only problem was I wasn't quite as drunk as he was. And he said I got a good look at her. And he said I thought to myself you're going to hate yourself in the morning. That's what I told him. You're going to hate yourself in the morning. But in the darkness... Come on. Yes. I may understand why. Don't, don't look at me like Sunday school children. You understand what's going on. Some of you live that lifestyle. And the devil is out to seduce. Yes, in every way. But we, as God's people, are smart. Come on. Paul said we are not ignorant of his devices. That's right. We will stay mathematically Hallelujah. true to our God. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Preacher friend of mine one time flew to Japan and he told me that he stayed in this five-star hotel to preach this conference and said, heard a knock at the door. He said he opened the door and there was a geisha girl standing there. And she bowed and said, can I come in? And he said, no. He reached in his pocket and got a picture of his wife. And he said, I hold, held that picture up and said, see that? He said, I kissed it. And I looked at her and said, she had tears streaming down her face. She said, thank you, and left. Brother, when the world sees a real Christian show up, they'll want what you got. Somebody say amen. Let's stand together this morning. Praise the Lord. Lord, I love you, and I worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Lord, I love you, and I worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Lord, I For the Lord. I want to pray a prayer of sanctification over this whole church. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, the throne of grace. We come with open hearts, O oh God, and we ask you, Lord, to create within us a clean heart. Give us the spirit of holiness to live for you, O oh God, in purity. Don't let the world intimidate us, God, into compromise. And don't let the world seduce us, God, into doing what we know would hurt our Lord and Savior and destroy our homes. God, give us the patience and the backbone and the strength that we need to stand against these spirits of the age and the spirit of the world that wants to cast its power over us. 
In the name of Jesus, I speak life. I speak boldness. I speak holiness. I speak your purity over every person under the sound of my voice. In the name of Jesus, we will serve you. In the name of Jesus, we will be victorious. In the name of Jesus, we will rise up against every seducing spirit that the enemy has. We will be everything you want us to be in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Glory to God. Turn and hug somebody. Let them know you love them.